says, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. These were the words that would define the new century, the century of the atom. And with that exciting new century came a lot of new exciting technology. And I'm here to tell you about all of it, along with the human experiences. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. And I'm also prepared to present the evidence in this room. The airfield at Wake Island is buzzing under the stifling August heat. Morale is high amongst the U.S. armed forces. Germany capitulated not four months ago. Now the task of taking down the Imperial Japanese Army and officially getting revenge for Pearl Harbor. The fleet of B-29 superfortresses, only a little over a year old, load their bombs and prepare for a bombing run over Honshu. The skies are clear and the plane's engines begin to roar into life. Seemingly out of nowhere, a radar blip, then 10, then 20. The Japanese have sent a wave of bombers and fighters to attack the island. Anti-air guns start firing. Scrambling around the airfield, there's a rush to get any fighters in the air to fight back. At first, no bombs, just the slow, methodical movement overhead. But then, a sharp black dot drops out of one of the bombers. Just one. Detonating overhead, the Japanese have succeeded in the Nigo project. An atomic bomb has been detonated over the airbase, crippling the United States and smashing morale. Ultimately, this triggers World War II to grow into a nuclear brawl. Untold millions will die. Hello and welcome to Come Hell or Heavy Water, where we talk about nuclear history, bombs, accidents, and energy. I'm your host, Nathan Kogeshal. Just to clear up any confusion, of course, that introduction was an alternate history. It was an alternate history of what would have happened if the NIGO project seceded. NIGO was an ill-fated plan for the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy to devise an attempt to make an atomic bomb. Our story begins very similarly to how the Manhattan Project started. A letter. Or a briefing, to be more exact, because it's the military or whatever. The letter was from a physicist, Tatsubora Suzuki. It was written in October 1940 and merely suggested that the Empire of Japan may be able to produce an atomic bomb by the end of the war. It was picked up by a certain Lieutenant General, Takedo Yashuda, who was interested in the discovery of nuclear fission. Yashuda contacted the famous Japanese physicist, Yoshino Nishina. So, I just gave a lot of information out without much context behind the people who were involved, so I'm going to dive into their stories. We like a more personal history here at Come Hell or Heavy Water. First, I want to talk about Tatsubora Suzuki, also known as Tayatsu Wakabayashi, but we'll talk about that pseudonym later. He has no relation to the car company, might I add. He was born sometime in 1912 in Nagoya, Japan. Now, Nagoya is a famous to this day for its ornate porcelain some of the finest to come out of Japan. And in a weird coincidence, Nagoya was the only town where uranium was present in every shop and factory. This was because uranium was used to paint the porcelain, giving it a nice green-yellow color. Neat! Anyway, he went to Tokyo Imperial University and studied physics, no specification, and x-rays, so he was on the right path for atomic science. He graduated in 1939, a year after the discovery of fission by Otto Hahn, and seemingly knew of the discovery as well. He was then hired by one of our main institutions we'll be talking about, the Institute of Physical and Chemical Research, or RIKEN. There, he really began to dig into the atomic problem, working with Yoshio Nishina, which should sound familiar. The two were tasked with fission research, and they worked on the problem throughout 1939 and 1940. Some context, Japan had been at war with China for two-ish years at this point, and were running out of room to, well, imperialize. So the situation was getting to a tipping point, and that tipping point was tipped off in 1940, when Suzuki wrote his report on the possibility of an atomic weapon and sent it to General Yashuda. Yashuda was born in 1889 somewhere in Okayama Prefecture. From his youth, he attended multiple military boarding schools pretty much exclusively. By 20, he was already a lieutenant in the Imperial Japanese Army. He went to Tokyo Imperial University as well and graduated in 1916 with an electrical engineering degree. By the way, if you wanted to go anywhere in life in Imperial Japan, you had to go to Tokyo Imperial University or Kyoto Imperial University. So you'll be hearing that for most of the people involved in NIGO. From there, he was promoted to a signal officer and went to Germany to study technical engineering, but on the outbreak of the war, he was recalled to the Empire in 1937. 
Arguably, World War II started in 1937 when Japan invaded Manchuria, but that's out of the scope of this podcast. Yet, I will be referring to the start of the war as 1937 in this episode as it pertains to Japan. When he returned, he was promoted to lead the Army Aeronautical Technical Research Institute. That's a mouthful. And subsequently became intrigued in the idea of nuclear physics and fission. And then he received the Suzuki Report, and our stories start to merge. But we have one more player before that, a Mr. Yoshio Nishina, known today as the father of nuclear physics in Japan. He was born in 1890, also in Okayama. He went to Tokyo Imperial University and was three years behind Yoshida, graduating in 1919 with an electrical engineering degree as well. Turning down an engineering job, he went to graduate school at Riken. He started with studying electrochemistry, but quickly switched to physics for more, quote, unsolved puzzles. And this is where things get interesting. In 1921, Riken sent him to the United Kingdom to study at Cambridge's Lavendish Laboratory. The man who ran that lab was none other than Ernst Rutherford, the father of nuclear physics and the discoverer of the proton. Niles Bohr also studied with Nishina in Copenhagen between 1923 and 28. They became very close friends. In fact, in 1937, Bohr visited Nishina in Japan with his wife right before the war started. Nishina returned to Japan in 1931 and started his own lab at Riken. He was interested in experimenting with quantum mechanics, cosmic rays, high energy beams, and of course, nuclear physics. He had quite a liking of cyclotrons, which was his favorite thing to build and experiment with. His first cyclotron was completed in 1937, assumingly that's why Bohr visited. It was the first ever built outside of the United States. Weirdly enough, he was directly helped by an American physicist, Ernst Lawrence, the inventor of the cyclotron. Lawrence helped him attain a large electromagnetic for his second large cyclotron, but communication was cut off between the two when the United States entered the war. Now, all of our stories converge. Suzuki was working under Nishina. Suzuki was working under Nishina when he wrote the report. It essentially said, we can theoretically do this, but practically probably not. This is a reoccurring theme. But Yoshida took it and ran with it. And he ran to Nishina, who agreed that, while yes, in theory, it could be done, practically, eh, maybe? I really wish I could find the transcript of the report, but it seems to be lost to time, or just available in Japan. At any rate, Yoshida recruited Nishina to help in the development of the atomic bomb. Lectures were held with other high-level officers in the Imperial Japanese Army over the theoretical bomb. They too were all on board with the idea, and from there Nishina was named the head of the Nigo project. It officially began April 1941 and was based at Riken University. This was pre-Pearl Harbor, mind you, so they might have been planning to use it on maybe China? Now, unlike the United States Empire building, Japan had a lot more geopolitics to think about. Once China was invaded and arguably conquered, there were only a few routes for Japan left. Being an imperial fascist state, expansion was part of the ideology, and in order to survive, expansion is necessary. To the north was the beast of the USSR. Unlike Germany, Japan did not have an ideological goal of eradicating Bolshevism. This ties back to Nigo, just bear with me. Also unlike Germany, they saw the USSR as an unbeatable enemy that could not be faced at that point in the empire. To the east was another sleeping giant, as the Japanese so fondly called us, the United States. While the Japanese would eventually see conflict with the United States as an inevitability, they were at no point ready for that. They were really kind of tricking themselves into believing that they were ready in 1941. Since the west was already taken, there was no other route, except the south. The idea of Nanshin Ro, literally meaning Southern Road, has its roots as far back as the Meiji Restoration. Japan has never been a resource rich country, and they knew that, so expansion was not only for ideological reasons, but also for resources. The resource important to us is uranium. They searched all over newly conquered lands Korea, China, Burma, and even Fukushima. Ironically, they looked in the city of, bear with me here, Hua Kwe which is now North Korea's largest uranium mine, and they didn't find it first. Think about if they did find it in 1940. If they were going at the same pace as the United States, they could have theoretically had a bomb in 1945. That scenario I made up at the beginning could have been real. World War II could have been a nuclear war, but between the Empire of Japan and the United States. Holy shit, that's terrifying. <laughs> 
Japan was also similar to the USSR, not in the sense of being a huge country, but the fact that they didn't have many fossil fuels. Coal and oil was limited. In 1932, they were extracting about 20 million tons, metric tons, and in 1925, oil reserves were about 3 million barrels. I'm going to compare that to the United States. I'm going to compare this to the United States, because, you know, that's who they were fighting. Coal production in the United States in 1930 was 362 million tons. Yep. Oil reserves were just shy of 15 million barrels, five times the amount of Japan. In fact, the United States' daily production output was the size of Japan's oil reserves. So arguably, Japan had a reason to start researching atomic power, but they didn't. Well, they did, but only for a brief moment before the war in Nishina's lab. The United States had been lowering oil exports to the fascist war machine in the East since 1937. Yes, we did sell oil to them up to 1940. What prompted us to stop was the early stages of Nanshin Ro, when Japan invaded Indochina. Japan's higher brass estimated that they had about two years of oil left, so they had to act fast. Around this time, Suzuki is writing the letter, and the officers are becoming more desperate. On top of the oil embargo, Japan still didn't have any uranium. They were getting minuscule amounts from the West, mainly Germany, for experience, but it would not yield the necessary 10 kilograms. Furthermore, Japan didn't have enough steel. They needed to make a large enough cyclotron. Suzuki said, quote, One of our four officers suggested that we should scrap five or six heavy cruisers to make a 50,000 ton facility. The idea was promptly rejected by Yoshida. Cyclotrons aren't exactly an efficient way of enriching uranium either. For example, a 3,000 ton cyclotron was running at University of Berkeley and it produced about 2.8 grams of uranium a day. So overall, Japan had little if any chance of actually producing a bomb, but they went on with it anyway. The structure of the project was very proceed step by step. Well, actually, I don't even know if that's a good way of describing it. More like, after you got one thing done, we'll figure out what's next. Priority for the project was also very low. We can see this in a few ways. For one, they never even attempted to build an experimental pile, even though they had the know-how. That is arguably the most important step to getting plutonium for a bomb, but it's unknown if they even knew plutonium was a better option. Also, the lack of uranium played into them not developing a pile. Secondly, they had a much more important and producing biological weapons research, in big quotes, facility called Unit 731. I'm going to go off on a little tangent on this because it deserves to be remembered as well. Unit 731 was a biological warfare research facility. They experimented regularly on Chinese civilians. The Japanese ironically called it the Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory, and it was run by the Surgeon General Shiro Ieshi, who ran the facility with vigor and enthusiasm. Experimenters often referred to their subjects as logs, asking each other, how many logs did you cut today? The place was a literal hell. I don't want to expose anyone to the torture that went on inside. It's available to read in multiple places across the web. The USSR managed to put some of the officers in charge on trial, and it doesn't matter to me that if it was a kangaroo court or not. They deserved everything they got coming to them. We, the United States, preferred to learn from this knowledge that was gained there and recruited many of the scientists, including Aishi. We claim the information as, quote, absolutely invaluable. It could never have been obtained in the United States because of scruple attached to the experiments on humans, and the information was obtained fairly cheaply." Unquote. I could keep going about how poorly we handled war criminals after the war, but I'm going to stop myself. So because of the success they were having at Unit 731, Japan opted to not fund the NIGO project all that much. But despite all of the disadvantages that faced the project, they did have some things going for them. For one, the war was going very well until they bombed Pearl Harbor. Even with the embargo, they basically walked through Indochina and got that sweet, sweet rubber. And even after Pearl Harbor, they did get bogged down in the Philippines, but spread incredibly wide and fast through the Pacific Islands. Remember, in 1941, the outlook on the war was still up in the air so the Japanese still thought there was a chance of winning. Adding on to battlefield success, Nigo had two incredibly smart scientists working on the project. Nishina studied with the father of nuclear physics and the man who would later go on to help build Chicago Pile 1. He was also one of the world's top experts on cyclotrons, 
they were sort of his baby. Before the war, he had his own lab, where he kind of just messed around with cyclotrons for the fun of it. While learning about atomic theory, I don't want to downplay that at all. Spoiler alert, they pretty much only got as far as building a cyclotron. So there was some speculation that Nishina knew this. He stated multiple times that yeah, the bomb was theoretically possible, but logistically impossible. Nishina didn't really do much with bomb design or theory while the project was actually running. He sort of just played around with his new cyclotrons. Also, he had incredibly close ties to the West, and was sort of apolitical, getting conscripted into the project rather than volunteering. It'll never be known if Nishina really was wanting to make a bomb or not, but the coincidental evidence points to the former. With that, I'd like to introduce the second scientist. With that, I'd like to introduce the second scientist, Bunsaku Arakatsu. Arakatsu was born in Haimji in 1890. Not much is known about his upbringing or family, but he eventually ended up at one of the Imperial Universities, we're not too sure, but he also studied throughout Europe in the 1920s. He studied under Einstein in Berlin, went to Cambridge, and Zurich as well. The man was all over the place with some of the top physicists of his day. In fact, when he returned to Japan, he built a particle accelerator in Taihaku Imperial University. He performed the first atomic nucleus collision experiments in Asia in 1934. While he didn't make the discovery of nuclear fission, he did find that when U-235 is split, about three neutrons result from it. There isn't much information about this guy, which is strange because he seems very important to Asian science history. At any rate, he eventually transferred to Kyoto Imperial University in 1936, where he was a professor of physics. He worked undisturbed until the Imperial Japanese Navy showed up at his office in 1942. Now I know what you're thinking. Nathan, haven't you been talking about the Imperial Japanese Army running Nigo this whole time? And yes, they were. The Imperial Japanese Army and Navy were constantly butting heads the entire war. Each side wanted to be the one who brought glory to the Empire and brought the Emperor's light to the rest of the world. In this case, the Emperor's light would be that of an atomic explosion. The Navy was also interested in the idea and created its own competing program, EFCO. So, with all the resource problems, now... Just like the atoms they were researching, the project split further, distancing them from their deadly goal. So on top of two different projects with two different scientists, they were taking two very different routes to get their much needed uranium. Nigo, the Imperial Japanese Army, and Nishino went the gaseous diffusion route. In previous episodes, probably all of them, I've made it clear that I'm not a physicist, but I'll try my best to explain what that means. It's a process of getting enriched uranium through uranium hexafluoride and this was the preferred method of getting enriched uranium for the United States as well. In fact, 33% of the world's uranium is produced through gaseous diffusion today. But what's done is the uranium hexafluoride is pushed through a semi-permeable membrane, normally very compressed nickel or aluminum, and through the miracle of science, what comes out is enriched uranium. From my understanding, which is very limited, all of this is in a gaseous state and is condensed. If anyone listening understands this better than I do, please say something. Arakatsu, similar to Nishina and Cyclotrons, really liked nuclear centrifuges. So that's how he wanted to get his enriched uranium. He specifically used a gas centrifuge. They rely on centripetal force to spin ions at a speed so great they eventually separate. It uses uranium hexafluoride as well, and the process yields statistically higher amounts of uranium-235 than gaseous diffusion. Centrifuges were supposed to be the replacement for gaseous diffusion, but it is not known why Nishina chose the gaseous diffusion route. They had separate labs in separate cities, and Nishina working at Riken in Tokyo and Arakatsu at Kyoto Imperial University. If anything exemplifies the rift between the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Imperial Japanese Army, it's that they couldn't even agree to work together on something that could seriously hinder, if not halt, the Allied advance. But they did have two really smart scientists working on the problem, and that was about the only advantage they had. Nigo and the Manhattan Project were running at essentially a parallel race, but nowhere near equal in terms of resources. The Manhattan Project employed 150,000 workers, scientists, and military personnel. Nigo maybe had about 150 people working on it, but that's a rough estimate. Two billion dollars was allocated to the Manhattan Project. That's $23 billion in 2018. The only number we have had for NIGO isn't actually NIGO, but EFCO. And that is $80,000, which was allocated to Arakatsu. K-1 
Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States all had sites dedicated to the procurement of uranium and atomic research, backed by a team of international scientists. NIGO had two who studied under some of those scientists and two laboratories. I'm stating all of this because if you search NIGO on the internet, pretty much every article is saying they came close. They didn't. Again, we get back to the problem of uranium. At best, they were making about one milligram a year. That's not even a gram. Suzuki is quoted to say, quote, At that rate, it would take 10,000 years to produce a bomb. And he's right. They needed 10 kilograms at least. But they did have the only cyclotron outside of the United States, which was pretty neat. Though not very important to bomb production. When the Imperial Japanese Army commissioned the project, they asked Nishina to lay out the research themes. There were five, which are as follows. Atomic bomb theory, separation of uranium, production of uranium hexafluoride, measurement of physical constants, and isotope analysis. Clearly, they were not very concerned. Honestly, if the words atomic bomb hadn't even been in there, the story would have just been about Japan's first reactors, which this does eventually lead to. These are all just early atomic experiments and general development of atomic theory rather than a bomb project if you ask me. This really kind of confirms the idea that Nishina was just in it for the cyclotrons. Research seriously drifted away from pretty much all five of those points when he got into his own lab. This can be seen in the fact that Nishina's lab was actually just a bunch of cyclotrons when the project ended. If he was serious about the bomb, there probably would have been more collaboration with Arakatsu, and, you know, some more advanced equipment. Nishina was notably apolitical and had been exposed to the West, along with studying with Einstein and Bohr's, who were originally against their discoveries being used for bomb procurement. It wouldn't surprise me if Nishina was dragging his feet per se when working on the project. Either that, or he knew all along he'd just get a bunch of money to make fancy cyclotrons. A Captain Yoji Ayoti would approach Arikatsu in 1942 to commission EFCO. In my opinion, he only did this because he knew the army had their own atomic project. He was under the assumption that the United States could not complete a bomb. Well, that's kind of sad. He headed the Atomic Research Committee in the Imperial Japanese Navy. Arikatsu was told to come up with an estimate of how long it would take to produce a bomb. He did not get the answer he wanted, or the one he was used to, 10 years. He subsequently disbanded the committee, though not the project. As we learned in the previous episode, pretty much all experimental piles were the predecessor for plutonium producing reactors. There was not an attempt by either Arakatsu or Nishina to even design, let alone build a pile. This was a major hindrance in the acquisition of uranium, and probably the largest mistake of the Ni-slash-Fgo projects. This may have been due to a lack of heavy water or graphite as a moderator, but Takechi Masu, who was helping Nishina with particle separation, said light water could have been sufficient for their needs. Or, as I've been arguing, we can never really know if these men had their hearts in the projects and really wanted to make a bomb. To me, the path is obvious enough, and I understand I have hindsight and all, but these were two noticeably apolitical physicists who spend their lives doing completely different work than atomic bomb theory. And, even when they were ordered to attempt to build one, they pussyfooted around it and didn't even design one. Could this be attributed to a lack of resources? Sure. But again, these guys were not exactly huge supporters of the regime. They were just scientists. At this point, the projects were reaching their peak, if you could even call it that. Japan's empire was also beginning to recede towards the home islands, and allied bombing raids began to scorch the paper and wood cities. Estimates said that enough uranium would be procured by 1944. They were very wrong. <laughs> if they were making it at 1 milligram a year, as stated earlier, they'd have 3 milligrams of enriched uranium, or 0.0003% of what they would need to make a bomb. Not much development was going on in 1944. I mean, in comparison to the Manhattan Project, not much development was happening at all. This could be due to the uranium and steel shortage, or that Nishina and Arakatsu really didn't care about the project. I think it's a combination of both. I'm sure some of y'all are thinking along the lines of, how can you argue that? Wouldn't they have miners making sure they were processing? Well, they did. But nuclear physics is complex, and it was in its infancy. The scientists working on the problem only knew specifics about cyclotrons and centrifuges, not necessarily bomb theory. And this goes for all new nuclear bomb programs, not just NIGO. So if the scientists only knew theory, the top brass knew nothing. The minders they had were trained in conventional warfare, and that's what they cared about. This is exemplified in a dialogue between Nishina and Major General Nobushi. 
Quote, if uranium is to be used as an explosive, 10 kilograms is required. Why not just use 10 kilograms of conventional explosive? Nishina replied, that's nonsense. So yes, while they were being watched by the government, the government could be seeing a process when they really didn't know what was going on. In April 1945, Nishina's facilities at Riken were bombed. Whether the United States knew what was going on there or not is unknown, but they probably didn't. Also considering the widespread use of firebombing, Riken was probably just collateral damage. Nishina would pack up what was left of his lab and move down to join Arakatsu in Kyoto. At this point, people began to jump ship. Some of the first to go were the first organizers of the project, Yoshida and Iodo. On the 7th of May 1945, Germany officially surrendered, ending the war in Europe. Yet, on March 25th, 1945, a U-boat was dispatched from Norway, and from there, it was due to set sail for Japan. The trip had been planned since late 1944, and its cargo specially set aside for this mission. The cargo in question was 1,200 pounds of uranium oxide. The ship had some other interesting cargo as well, including General Ulrich Kessler and two Japanese officers. The trip went generally as planned until the 30th, when their Goliath transmitter stopped working. They probably didn't realize this, but the Allies had captured the German naval headquarters. Next, on the 4th of May, they received a portion of a broadcast stating that Admiral Dernitz was in charge following Hitler's suicide. Finally, on the 10th of May, they surfaced and heard Dernitz's call to all remaining U-boats to surrender. And they didn't believe it until they came in contact with U-873, who confirmed the report. On the 12th, they decided to surrender to the Americans, believing they would let them go. And they did, rather than the British, who would keep them prisoner. During the trip to Portsmouth, Maine, the two Japanese officers committed suicide. The U-boat would be demolished in 1947 while it was used as a torpedo target. The uranium oxide was intended for Japan. Whether the Germans knew of Nigo is unknown, and they might have just been trying to purge resources from the Reich as to not let them fall into Allied hands. The uranium on board inevitably did. It is speculated that out of spite, it was used in Little Boy, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The 1,200 pounds of uranium would make about 3.5 kilograms of uranium-235, not nearly enough of what was needed at Nigo. A researcher remembered knowing about the shipment, saying, quote, Nishina told us that a U-boat from Germany would bring us uranium. It never arrived. Fairly ominous, if you ask me, and very fitting for the Japanese-German cooperation throughout the war. Ultimately, you cannot have two master races. Oh, <laughs> that was in poor taste. <laughs> By this point, no progress was made toward the end goal of a bomb. And in June 1945, Nishina declared the project over. The project was especially over by August 1945 when the atomic bombs fell. Strangely enough, Arakatsu was commissioned to investigate the aftermath of the bombings. Nishina, Arakatsu, and Suzuki never faced any criminal charges, and they shouldn't have. Yes, they were working on an atomic bomb, but good god, were they really? They never tried to design one. They couldn't get enough uranium. Both of them were continuing previous research and they were absurdly apolitical for the time. The United States let a lot of war criminals go post-war and allowed them to be integrated back into their countries. So if you all want to get all up in arms about the United States letting go two scientists, I highly encourage you to research the high command trials. Anyway, Nishina was granted permission to continue his research with his beloved cyclotrons. He planned on researching medical isotopes and biological isotopes, whatever the hell that is, until Secretary of War Henry L. Stinson had other plans for him. He ordered on November 24, 1945 that all cyclotrons in Japan be destroyed. The ones at Riken that Nishina worked on were thrown into the Gulf of Tokyo. He was named president of Riken and did his best to bring the institute out of the rubble, but passed away in 1951 before any substantial gains were made. Not much is known about Arakatsu in the first place, and his post-war activities are even hazier. Again, he went to investigate the atomic bombings, and did so. Post-war, he continued to do research, which in my research, was unspecified. He passed away in 1973. I want to mention that the Japanese hastily got rid of pretty much all of the documents relating to Nigo, and that's why information is so limited on to who and what actually got done. But Suzuki did give an interview in 1995, where he did give much of the information that we do have. But in the end, they never really got close to a bomb. Unless... 
<laughs> conspiracy time. And I think it's the first one we've covered on Come Hell or Heavy Water. And boy, howdy, is it a doozy. One report from a Mr. David Snell of Maiden, Louisiana, claims that on August 10th, 1945, somewhere in the Gulf of Japan, the Japanese successfully tested an atomic bomb. This was only three days after Hir <laughs> This is hilarious. This was only three days after Hiroshima. So I'm going to say war jitters, sensationalization, propaganda, and probably justification is what led to this article. Snell joined the army late in 1945 and was tasked with investigating crimes committed against the United States. His source was an unidentified man who, quote, gave names, dates, facts, and figures on the Japanese atomic project, which I submitted to the United States Army Intelligence in Seoul. The War Department is withholding much of the information. To protect the man that told me this story, at the request of the army, he has given a pseudonym, Captain Tetsu Wakabayashi. Yeah, I told you we'd get back to that. He claimed that the witness reported a bright flash 1,000 yards across that wiped out ships that were being used as targets. Wait, they didn't want to use ships to build the bomb, but they wanted to use ships to blow it? Okay. He even mentioned Nishina in his article saying that he built one of the largest cyclotrons in the world, which is true at the time, but it really didn't matter because there wasn't any uranium. <laughs> The article goes on to claim that the Japanese had more bombs at the ready, but didn't want to use them because they were too risky. And rather they destroyed them to not let those damn Ruskies get their hands on them. Okay. It goes on to say, quote, The Japanese scientists who developed the bomb are now in Moscow, prisoners of the Russians. They were tortured by their captors seeking the atomic know-how. Even though the Russians were well on their way to atomic development, as we discussed in the previous episode. The article was published only in one small newspaper, the Atlantic Constitution, and it wasn't even printed until 1946. General Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, is quoted to say about the article, News to me. It is weird that Snell knew that the Japanese had an atomic program, but that was probably just speculation or a shot in the dark to get a sensational story. But that's a good segue to my next point. The Japanese sent a letter to the United States declaring the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima against the Hague Convention. Did they forget that they were working on a bomb? Not to mention, did they forget about the mountains of dead Chinese that they left in their wake? But we tend to forget, when discussing Nigo, that the Japanese could not bomb the United States. The bomb, if it was ever made, was planned to be used in the Pacific, on military targets, specifically the Wake Islands. And what if that did happen? Nuclear war in 1945? Japan never surrendering? Complete atomic bombing of the main islands? We'll never know. The existence of the Nigo project has been used to justify the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I think that's pretty bad. Um, the Japanese, as we just covered, weren't even close to getting an atomic bomb. We didn't know that they were building an atomic bomb, building in big quotes. So I think the idea of using that as justification as atomic bombings is very bad and very wrong. But that's the story of Nigo, the ill-fated Japanese atomic bomb project. Sorry this episode is shorter than normal, not only am I in school again, but the Japanese destroyed a lot of documents containing the information about the project. But there's a lot of parallels between Nigo and the Unareven in Nazi Germany, but I'm going to save that for another episode. Thank y'all for listening. This has been Come Hell or Heavy Water. Uh, 